Matthew, can you uh, tell the listeners about where your site's located? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. PA Museums has been a great supporter of us, uh, as well as the grant programs run through PHMC. So the Connor Pidgey Institute is located in Southern Franklin County, outside the village of Welsh Run, the nearest town being Mercersburg. It is right on the Mason-Dixon line. Um, it is a very rural site. Um, it is surrounded by Brethren Farms, uh, but that ruralness does give it uh, kind of its beauty too, because we are preserving uh, the cultural and natural resources of the Appalachian frontier. Uh, not that one, started bad there. Um, so yeah, by not being surrounded by cities and roads, when people visit the site, they are seeing a preserved 18th century homestead. Uh, and so sure, there's no, uh, there's no gas stations nearby, there's no uh, restaurants, uh, but if you travel 15 minutes from a local town to get this kind of pristine frontier, uh, it's definitely got that element for you. Yeah. So uh, I, we'll probably get into it a little bit. I mean, um, it's uh, it's cuts both ways, I guess, being sort of in that bucolic setting, but also <laughs> pretty far from a city center. Yeah, what, what I like to say is no one ever visits the Conopidgig Institute unless they intended to, because you're not just going to drive by it on the uh, highway because there is no highway. Yeah. Um, but one of the things we do well is we offer free programs every Saturday, year round from 10 to 5, hands on engaging programs focused on primarily 18th century life, but also nature walks, tree plantings uh, and other activities. So when you do visit, you had make a day of it. Uh, our first acre site includes woodlands, wetlands, ponds, gardens. So visit for a program about cooking in a bake oven in the 18th century, go for a nature walk, stop in a picnic, and take an exhibit tour as well of our museums. And with that, you've got a reason to visit. Yeah, so I, I want to uh, flesh this out a little bit more just because I think it's... Um it seems to be a major key to the successes you've been having there. You, you hit upon people having to go there, you know, they have to travel, they have to have, there's a reason for them to go there. And can you tell us a little bit more about that strategy of every Saturday trying to do something? Because I think that's really genius because people go, okay, yep, this Saturday we're gonna head out. There's gonna be something going on where as before, they, maybe they didn't have that expectation. Exactly. So I actually took over the Carnegie Institute during COVID. Uh, and so everywhere, of course, is reevaluating how they operate. Um, and my kind of observation was that with a lot of small museums and historic societies, when they're only open the third Saturday of every month when it's a blue moon and Mavis has the key, it makes it really hard for visitors to simply put on their phone what's nearby and you go and it's closed. Oh, it's, it's open next Sunday on the 5th. Yeah. And so as a visitor, that makes tourism difficult. So because we have staff year round, uh, it made sense to maintain that Saturday programming. And as a result, we get visitors every week. Uh, even last month when it was cold, we had 70 people turn out for one of our Saturday programs on frontier hunting, which is very surprising in February for a museum for a free program. Uh, so it's really, it's all about that digital age of search engine optimization, what is open, what is nearby. Um, and the other benefit from, this, from an historical point of view is for the living history museums that close during the winter because it's not comfortable to be outside in the cold, they only show one facet of history. They show how people lived in spring and summer. Uh, but our colonial ancestors lived in the winter too. So by doing year-round programs, we can focus on how did people stay warm? What different activities did people in a homestead do in January that they wouldn't have been doing in July? So it's got an historical education asset as well as the tourism asset. Yeah. Can you uh, tell us more about a little bit of the behind the scenes of, you know, was there anyone that said, oh, well, we can't do a 500 person reenactment every weekend. That's impossible. Like, how did, how did you deal with sort of the, you know, we can't do that? Or maybe you didn't have any of that. Maybe it was just sort of a willingness to try anything. 
Well, so yeah, so again, starting in the middle of COVID, I had a very supportive board, but there was no other volunteers kind of in place. So a lot of those early activities were what me and my board could do. And that evolved into bringing in this wealth of very talented volunteers who saw that, hey, this place does stuff every Saturday. We don't have to wait until the next big reenactment to go with 500 people. I can just go and talk about me and cooking or sewing. Yeah. Uh, and we have such a kind of wealth of volunteers now that I can, re I can be out of the programming a lot more. Uh, we also have uh, two part-time paid interns and we're about to open up to a new position as well. So now that we've got this programming on such a successful footing, I probably will be taking a step back to do more executive director roles. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it worked out well from a COVID model. It translated well into a programming model for long term. Um, and it's increased our fiscal standing as well because our donors uh, and our grantors see consistent visitor engagement uh, and that means more donations. Yeah. So you, you have, I mean, what, what are the numbers? I mean, in terms of visitorship, what, any, any raw, like. Uh, yeah. So, um, so last year we had around 10,000. Um, a large part of that is through education bookings. Um, and again, that's where the Saturday program does help us. We, we, we could template a lot of our education stuff in these Saturdays. Um, and so last year, we won Educator of the Year for the Cumberland Valley Business Alliance, as well as Nonprofit of the Year, because our education programs went through the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, in October, we had 1,111 students in paid programs. And that's all on weekdays, Tuesday to Friday. Um, and it was the same in April. I remember spring of last year for about three months, I wore a cocked hat four days out of five and I only wear cocked hats if we have a program. Uh, so yeah, so those education bookings plus the regular visitors, which can range from 70 people in winter to 200 people in summer, plus the people that do dog walking and birding averages around 10,000 per year. Yeah. Um, and what's incredible for that is we are a small museum. We are a small nonprofit and that isn't the norm. And even three years ago at the Conica Dig Institute, before I started, there were maybe a couple of bookings per year. And now we have bookings four days out of five. Uh, so that growth uh, is all due to that hands-on programming and family saying, my kids would enjoy that. Yeah. Now you, uh, you're talking about growing capacity too. I think growing capacity with the your volunteer core and your and the staffing and the paid interns. I think it, uh, it it seems like you were growing capacity in the kinds of programming that you could offer too. I mean, it it seems like you were okay with starting small or maybe not. You know, feeling like you had to chew off you know something massive every Saturday. I mean. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, I, I definitely, I thrive when I can do something myself. Um, and that has been one of the challenges of running an organization is realizing sometimes you have to delegate to other people, delegate to more talented people. Uh, so with the, with the, with the historic programming, uh, that has been easy to start small and then kind of roll out. Yeah. It's, our growth actually outstripped our capacity for a little bit last year. And that's why we're currently hiring another full-time member because between education programs, grants, membership, outreach, um, <laughs> construction, historic preservation, uh, I re-roofed our tavern last year of our volunteers and that took a lot of time. So yeah, my time is a little stretched. Uh, this gray is a new thing. Uh, so yeah, so we did grow faster than capacity, uh, but with this new position starting in the next few weeks, uh, uh, 2023, I think we're now going to be at a point where we can all stay at a good pace and continue to grow. Yeah. Now, is it a safe bet to say that you grew up in South, uh, South Central Pennsylvania? <laughs> South Central, yes. <laughs> Um, so I am, I'm from Salisbury in, in Wiltshire, uh, in England, do I have an English map behind me? No, I don't, uh, usually do. Uh, so yeah, Salisbury in Wiltshire, about five miles from Stonehenge. But when I came here to America, I had mainly like West Country accent here, because that's how we speak in Wiltshire. 
And uh, when I first came it uh, 13, 14 years ago now uh, with my wife to marry her, no one really understood what I was saying. So in working in tourism for the last 13 years, my accent has devolved to a colonial hybrid to the point now my family think I sound 100% American. <laughs> average visitor thinks I'm either a great actor or Australian. <laughs> uh, so it, it can be a bit confusing. And of course, at the Carnegie Institute, all of the settlers there were Welsh. Um, and so people are like, oh, your accent's perfect. It's like, <laughs> oh, it's not Welsh. <laughs> So how did you bring us back? Uh, you've been there, what, a few years now? I've been, I've been at the Carnegie Institute since June of 2020. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so before that, I worked for the Department of Natural Resources at Fort Frederick State Park. Did that for about eight, nine years, mm -hmm. working in 18th century history, which of course was good training for this position. Also working as a park ranger, as a trail technician, which taught me a lot about land usage and management. Yeah. Um, and because the Conoco is a 30 acre site, that definitely applies. I can do tree plantings as well as history. Before working for the Department of Natural Resources in Maryland, I worked at a 12th century castle in England, as you do. Okay. Um, so I worked for English Heritage, Old Serum Castle at Stonehenge. Uh, and that's what I did after college. And that's really what made me decide I wanted to work in public history. Um, mm. Before working there, I actually wanted to be a forensic scientist. Uh, I was a, a science major with history as a minor, but I started working with, with history and I realized just how fun it is to take an everyday story of someone from the past and bring that to the present. Uh, and so yeah, I've been doing it ever since. Did the, did the board, um, w without giving away, you know, uh, anything confidential, but when you got there, did, did, did you kind of have a sort of a clean slate? Was it sort of a, what was the mandate of, hey, try, let's try some new things? You know, we, we, we got to mix it up. I mean, yeah. Definitely. Not that the place was, you know, going down in flames before you got there or anything, but like, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah. So again, it's COVID, so all buildings are locked down. Um, it's COVID, so all volunteers are locked down. Uh, the year before, the uh, organization had gone through some staff and changing anyway. So it very much was a blank slate. Uh, and both by working closely with the board who wanted to grow, we evaluated the original mission statement which is to preserve and educate about the cultural and natural resources of the Appalachian frontier. And then we looked at what we were described as in the founding statement in 1994, which is a hands-on regional learning center. And so together we said hands-on regional learning center, it says it right there. Yeah. But it means we don't publish scholarly papers. Uh, I don't write books, uh, but they, they've been very supportive. And of course the public and community has too of focusing on that hands-on elements yeah yeah so um what was i going to ask you about that um <clears throat> so the the institute aspect is is where where does that come from what is that a carryover from uh from that original founding the conica yeah. institute Kanaka Jig, of course, is an Anape word for the waterway that runs through here, the Kanaka Jig, water of mate winding turns. And the Kanaka Jig part is because in the 18th century, this entire Cumberland Valley was referred to as the settlement on the Kanaka Jig. Chambers, when he builds his fort there, Chambersburg, is the fort on the Kanaka Jig. When George Washington's in Williamsport, Maryland today, he says, I'm at the settlement on the Kanaka Jig. So, Everyone in the region was just the settlement on the Conica Jig. Institute was because it was supposed to be a place to preserve and educate on the history. And in its past, it did have a lot of lectures, seminars, and it has published books. Uh, but all those things do, of course, take a lot of time. Yeah. Usually locked away in a library, which is a beautiful library. Uh, and so we still do genealogy requests. We still do publish. But the world is changing. Now we publish videos. Uh, now we take our programs into schools to reach 300 middle school kids. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we may get to the point again when we start writing uh, theses, but uh, yeah, not this year. 
You know, you've been talking and I've been thinking about how, um, you know, in some ways, I think executive directors or, or administrators of sites wish that they could, like, if you could just, if you could for a month, pretend your organization was a business mm -hmm. and I was the business owner and I didn't, you know, what would you do to make your business thrive? What would you do to turn your di business in a different direction? Um, and sometimes I feel like talking with colleagues that it'd be nice for like a month. You're a business owner. Uh, there's no committees. There's no, there's no board. Like this is what I would do if I could just wave different magic wands. And um but it doesn't work that way, you know. You, you, you're you're juggling so many different uh, opinions where where you should go, and um, but it sounds like at this point you're um, you you have a very united board, and of yeah, course, you're seeing the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, de def definitely, everyone's rowing in the same direction. So I'm very yeah. appreciative of them. And yeah, I, I do agree. I, one of the things, of course, about businesses is you have different department heads uh and in our role of course we have to kind of be everything i would yeah. love to have just a month to write uh our interpretive panels which is a funded project we have right now and just refocus really on telling that story of the indigenous people of the women on the frontier fact checking using graphic design and just focus on that every day and i could probably get it done very quickly one of the challenges that we face is while doing that interpretive panel project, I got Saturday programs. The roof starts leaking. The we need to do a membership drive. Uh, I have people doing genealogical quests. So it is that juggling. Um, yeah. But that is also one of the fun things about being in this role is it doesn't get monotonous. No. How do you? Let's get into how you organize your workflows and your your time and and uh, you. Know, that's another thing I think could be really useful for people to hear about. Um, I'm always fascinated about how uh, people organize themselves. And um, sure. there's the sort of sticky note method that I call the sticky note method. And I'm not entirely sure if that's a method, but, uh, but how, do you, how do you work through it? So I, because of my past experience with the Park Service and then before them with uh, English Heritage did a wonderful job training, I have kind of a tier of priorities. Number one is safety. Um, it doesn't matter if we're doing the greatest program in the world, if a tree is about to fall on someone, uh, that's a liability. So make sure that anyone visiting the site is safe. Yeah. Then it is kind of visitor satisfaction. And, and that runs from both in-person visitors to our members or our donors. Um, and then from there, it is kind of growth from projects. So growth takes a backseat to the present, but we kind of we do have to run it tandem. Um, and then my priorities is just being as prompt as possible. So if someone has donated $1,000 uh, via mail, I certainly want to be replying to them as soon as possible. I tend to get most of my emails and letters out within a 24 hour window. Yeah. Uh, and that has helped our donor stewardship because they see we've taken note of their contribution and we care. Um, that's helped with our business partners uh, because they don't have to wait a week and a half to get a reply. Yeah. Um, they know it's going to be instantaneous. And that helps me because if I waited a week and a half, I was like, I'll pin that project for now. So much other stuff's going to come in yeah. uh, that it'd be easy to lose it. Uh, yeah. And that's one of the worst things you can do kind of running a nonprofit with donors is forget to acknowledge someone or worse, miss a grant deadline or a grant report. So I like to tackle things as they can come in as quickly as they can with that yeah. priority list of safety, satisfaction and then growth do you use a do you use a, a a list format do you use a whiteboard format do you use how how do you how, like how do you get into the, the nitty-gritty of it so uh, i am blessed and i have an incredible memory yeah uh and i remember everything people have emailed me uh including dates yeah uh, if gmail was white um I would probably uh, have a panic attack. 
<laughs> uh, because if if the chance to send me mailing you and I, I'll read it, Mark Mark has unread. And at the end of every day, I do is unread as a variable, and I'll yeah. see what to do. And so I like to end the day with nothing in the inbox that hasn't been fulfilled. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is uh, Google calendars on a phone. Yeah. Uh, so for those kind of growth and projects, for example, recently someone wanted me to reevaluate one of our leaflets that they could publish uh, for local business bureau. And we already have several site tours, but it could have used updating. So rather than say I'm gonna get to this now, which I wasn't gonna do, I looked at a random date in my calendar where I didn't have anything. And yeah. I put the date in that three weeks from now, I'm gonna do this, but it's not a priority today. Yeah. By scheduling time for it now, three Tuesdays from now, I'll, I'll get it done. Yeah, I love putting tasks and to do things in my calendar. And then when I have a calendar review, I go, oh, next Monday, I'm, I got to finish that grant. Or next Tuesday, I've got to remember to email so-and-so. Sometimes I'll do that. Um, one thing, I, I don't want to forget this because I want to hear what you're doing uh, about um, workflows and priorities, especially for donors. And we had um, a workflow here where we would receive a check and then it kind of go through the normal processing. And then because of the timing of when we would write the thank you letters and when we would get it to the bookkeeper, it was, uh, we, we realized that there was an extra week uh, time added on to the time we finally took this bag mm. to the bank. Because we, we, we had some feedback like um, from a couple donors of, my, my check isn't cashed yet. Mm -hmm. And we're like, well, if I'm getting it right away and then we're making the uh, deposit and QuickBooks right away and then we're writing that, why is it taking? And we noticed that this didn't work out the calendar by the time one, of, one person on staff ran to the bank and actually took it there and physically deposited. So there, there was an example of we decided that um, that was just something I was going to do uh, a week ahead of time that I was going to take the bag with the checks. And so we would eliminate one week of waiting time for the deposits of the checks. And, um, you know, it's kind of a stupid thing, but it, but it shows that you've got to be constantly evaluating those workflows and, you know, it, it's some people want to see their checks deposited rather quickly, you know? So do you have a, what do you, you have quite a bit to go to get to a bank, I guess. Yeah, so in that sense, at least, the workflow of checks coming in, acknowledgements, QuickBooks, accounting and deposit, all of those are steps on me. So that definitely speeds up the workflow. Yeah. But what I do, because I am 15 minutes away from a town where our bank is, uh, basically once a week, there's usually something I need to go out for, whether it's mailing, banking, buying yeah. food prep, half cooking programs. So I, uh, I like to kill as many birds with one stone with that. So on the day I do a deposit, there's also a day I go to a business to solicit sponsorships and go to the post office and go. So if I'm going away from CI, away from the Conic Institute, yeah. I'm knocking out all of my town tasks in one go. Yeah. I have a shameless plug. Uh, there's a um, young woman named Lindsay Baker, who's the executive director of Maryland Humanities. And Lindsay and I wrote a blog post, uh, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 10 years ago about how to, uh, how to have an empty inbox. And uh, <laughs> we kind of go through a step-by-step. -step. And um, we were at a conference one time and we were debating on who had more organized email. And I said, well, if you can't beat me, I don't have any emails in my inbox. <laughs> and she said, no way. I said, and I said, yeah. She said, well, I don't have any in my inbox either. And then we started riffing on, uh, well, how did you how did you accomplish that? And it was just sort of a methodology of how you can uh, prioritize and uh, keep your inbox organized. And um, we were chatting before the recording started about responding to emails and how important that is um, to get back with people. Even something as simple of, you know, I got your email. Um, I'll get back in touch with you right away. You know, have you? 
I've been with folks where uh, you don't hear anything, you know, and it's like weeks and weeks and weeks. I, I have extreme spam anxiety. Because <laughs> if someone's not replying to me, that's one thing, that's on them. But yeah. my fear always is that I've emailed someone with an answer to their question, but it's been filtered to their spam because I sent a lot of emails. Yeah. Uh, and so I constantly fear that people haven't received word from me and they might be thinking bad of me. And so when I send the follow-up, they usually say, like, yeah, I got your email. <laughs> uh, usually I I'll speak to them in person. I was like, yeah, I read it, but I just didn't have time to reply. So with that sense, all I can say to everyone who's kind of in the same position is, do your utmost to be diligent about replying. And at least that way, the burden is off your shoulders of communication. Uh, yeah. I, do, I do wish everyone would do as you said and at least say, I've read this, I'll get back to you because yeah. it would help my anxiety. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and it's, it's tough, especially if you have something that is critical. Uh, like I'm telling all of my volunteers that blank is happening on this day. So I'm telling all my board that we need to make this decision. Um, so I find with that, if you kind of add something in the subject line, if, if you're a prolific email like me, an email for like everything, if it's super important, add something in a subject line of urgent response needed or please read. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're talking we're talking a little bit about programs being organized and, and all right, fine, Matthew, that's all well and good. But you're, you know, what do you what is the budget growing? Have you seen the increase in donations? What you know, why why is this all you know worth talking about? Like what the bottom line? What so when I started at the Conica Jig Institute, uh, its budget was month to month um, in terms of our income. Uh, yeah. Kind of living hand to mouth. Uh, we raised, we did a successful ca capital campaign, uh, matching campaign in 2021 with our founder, Dr. John Stauffer. Uh, and for the first time ever in 2021, in CI's entire existence, the general membership donations outweighed our big founding donations. And in 2022, for the first time ever, we received a new donation, a new donor that outweighed again the foundation uh, originals last year our projected income was ninety thousand dollars over what we expected to receive okay uh so uh so yeah definitely the, the, the nitty-gritty there is we are able to grow right now because we have received an incredible amount of support uh from donations from grants uh and from membership and that's been one of my goals with the content institute which did rely very heavily on kind of single donors was number one to bring the donors and the general membership pool kind of to contribute equally and then my long-term goal is to bring philanthropic, philanthropic uh, money donations to be a smaller portion so in 2020 and 2019 even before i started grants was a very fairly small proportion of what we uh, had on income. But because of our successful programming, we can now relate much more with grantors. And now grants are on the rise. So I'd like to see grants paying for more of our kind of programs than the members are essentially. Yeah. Uh, we received very generously from Franklin County's uh, impact grant, $70,000 uh, this, uh, this month actually, uh, to improve outdoor spaces. Uh, we received $4,000 from the PHMC uh, Museums Project for education programs and received $10,000 from Americana Corners Preserving America grant. Um, so those grants will allow us to do so much more. But as you know, the big thing to bear in mind is most grants are project-based. Right. Uh, and so we still need those donations from members to support essentially the electric bill. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the challenges is kind of projects that will help us grow, but also maintaining the the essentials. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think it uh, can weigh heavily on um, directors, especially when um, there's the sense of, um, oh, well, you know, Matthew is 
you know, Matthew is the reason X, Y, and Z is happening, but really good directors, of course, try to build capacity so that it isn't, you know, oh, it's the Matthew show. Therefore, if you remove variable Matthew, what happens to the show, right? And we're always worried about that as directors. It's like, no, it can't be, we have to build capacity so this organization thrives no matter who, you know, who is in this seat. Now, granted, there's personality traits that, you know, uh, color an, an organization, you know, the director kind of leads the um, the tone. But can yeah. you speak to that? And maybe you could get into the the position you're hiring too. Yes, you know? um, so that that is exactly what I kind of put as our main goal for our strategic plan. I called it simplified, survive the loss of one. Whether that's surviving the loss of one major donor or survive the loss of one board member or survive the loss of an executive director, an organization needs to be able to survive the loss of one. Because I could be hit by a bus tomorrow. Do I have the, yeah. I could put the contingency plan in place that someone else can step in. Obviously, every time a leading face leads, donors and uh, members will be a little unsure. And that's why the, the, the plans are going to be in place that someone's stepping into my role. Their rep, the CI is strong. Um, the store of South Carroll County is strong. It doesn't matter who the face is. Someone else, everyone knows the institution itself is its own force. So consistency is important with that. Making sure you're on mission, anyone stepping into the role doesn't say, you know what, we're going to be a 20th century tractor farm. <laughs> and then their members like, what that's a bit of a change right. um so yeah so survive the loss of one um is important which is why in, as you said increased staffing is important so you can always be kind of not training your replacements but certainly making sure that there is someone there who knows uh the nitty-gritty yeah as, as you mentioned um in the next few weeks of uh 2023 uh, we will be hiring a full-time visitor services facilitator. I'm currently doing the interviews current, uh, this week. Okay. Uh, and that position will be a position between me and our paid interns to be that full-time face that knows all the institutional priorities. That when we have new staff or new volunteers or new students or new donors, they're here year-round. They know it all. Because currently our, our staff, uh, our paid interns from Shippensburg University are incredible assets. They bring energy, they bring new knowledge and learning, but they are here for a semester. They leave and we get a new intern. And so every time I have to be the person that passes on that knowledge, because right now that's that's what we have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so having another full-time person will allow us to do more. Um, and unfortunately, allow me more time to be in the office, writing grants, doing yeah. accounting, the, the less glamorous stuff, but the things that allow us to continue growing. Yeah. Well, without, um, maybe you can't disclose too much, but you know, the, the future, are there, you know, any, any, you know, really big plans or visions that the, you know, the board has for the Institute? Yeah. So, um, so I mean, not, it's not really future because it's in the next uh, next few months, but this $70,000 we got from the county to improve outdoor spaces is gonna go a long way. Uh, we're getting eight ADA compliant picnic tables, bike racks, um, $20,000 is going on early pre-K outdoor nature playground. Uh, and those assets are gonna change the way that families use the site because it's now it's, it's like a state park. It's got history, museums, it's got picnic areas, it's got a playground. Uh, so that's going to make site usage more. And in long term, there's a couple of different directions that the place could go in. We have several historic structures. Uh, there are always people looking to donate a cabin. So there's a possibility of a new cabin that's focused on a blacksmith shop or a schoolhouse or even a fort. Uh, there was a Fort Philip Davis on our property. Mm. Uh, so a new, a new building would be great. But again, you've got to grow the staff capacity because currently we've got a few people running around maintaining 30 acres and four historic houses. Yeah. Add another building to that, that's more. Then you've got to add interpretation. Is adding another building worth it if you don't have enough people to interpret it? 
where I would love to see the Institute go is we, we demonstrate 18th century homestead life. We have a garden, a bake oven, a tavern, um, a well. And so we focus on kind of home and hearth life skills, yeah. but we don't have any animals. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask you about husbandry. I think animal husbandry would be the one of the biggest ways we could grow as an educational programming area because you can't really call it a farm unless you have animals. Right. Um, and again, that is staffing capacity. Uh, do we have someone on staff who's full time and knows how to milk a goat? Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, can mend the fence and, and the chicken coop kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 And that, and then so, but in terms of visitorship, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's big because you start bringing in the animals in and that, that attracts, absolutely, know, especially families with young children. Right. Um, but then I can't imagine the budget, the budget for that kind of a thing. Yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot of organizations that do it very well. Uh, yeah. If we did launch that, we would probably partner with some to kind of get their, their budgeting model. Uh, there are local farmers around us that will occasionally lend me a goose or a goat. Uh, so yeah. that's more of a kind of a stock gag thing. But yeah, I do, I do think animals are like one of the ways that we could expand. If you're going true pipe dream, um, uh, I know our founder uh, would still love for us to have a newer, bigger visitor center where we could have large lectures and seminars. Yeah. Um, but that really depends on the community, uh, the support. Uh, and also kind of how this community around us develops. Yeah. As I said, currently we are surrounded by local brethren farms, very rural area, um, and that adds its kind of pristineness to the site. Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine what would happen if one of the farms next door sold to, say, a giant warehouse. Right. Uh, or built a Sheets or a McDonald's along the strip. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we have to be aware of the changing landscape as well. Yeah, what a what a really important thing to to keep an eye on and kind of keep keep your finger on the pulse there. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the whole flavor would change, right? If the you know housing development gets put up and right, you know, right. Is there a do you have any kind of buffer areas? Um, so yeah, so fortunately, um, our our founder over the last few years still had land adjacent to the Connacht Institute. Yeah. So he's been donating parcels of it. Uh, and so we've kind of expanded a little bit to create that buffer zone. Uh, I would like it to go just a little bit further to protect our pond and our wetlands and our woods. Because yeah. if someone got those and decided to blaze the entire woods for lumber, uh, yeah. that would be hurt our birding habitats. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's one of those unforeseeable futures. Is there a, there's a, there's a creek that runs through there as well, right? Yeah, the Welsh Run is a stream that feeds the Conica Jig, uh, named Welsh Run because all the settlers this region were of Welsh descent, Davises, Shelby's, Rosses. Yeah. Um, and so we do tree plantings to restore that stream health uh, with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation because streams here directly affect the bay down in Maryland. And that's one of the sad things that in CI's 30 acres, we're really good about environmental conservation. And yeah. um, we do it as part of our education. Unfortunately, literally one farm next to me, they recently cut down all their trees, burnt them just to make a few extra acres of uh, crop tillage. Yeah. Um, and it was trees right against the stream. Um, so it was sad for me to see because soil erosion now it's yeah. happy to see because the wood could have been used and it was just burnt because it was an inconvenience um, and that's where kind of educating your community is so important whether that's students or your neighbor landowners and let them know that you probably could have sold that lumber to someone and they would have processed it you probably could have left those trees they're helping your stream which 10 years from now because it has no soil uh, retention is going to be expanding into your coverage anyway. So, yeah, yeah. Well, any final words of wisdom to our friends in the public history uh, or even living history arena? Any? Yeah. Anything? So, uh, my biggest thing is partnerships. Um, mm. Again, when I started the Conic Against You, I was new to Pennsylvania. 
Um, so I didn't know anyone. Yeah. And I immediately kind of reached out to people around us. Um, and as a lot of you have probably experienced, a lot of history sites kind of turtle up, even if they are next door to another one. Uh, it's like, well, that's, that's their games, is mine. It's like, partner. Um, even after sort of sharing each other's events, yeah. um, making before I did my event calendar this year, I contacted all the EDs of local museums and made sure they didn't have any major events planned for those days. Yeah, but I didn't want to overlap. I didn't want to steal someone else's funder. Um, so partnerships and kind of open discourse is so useful. Yeah. And again, that's why the PA Museums Network has been so useful for me because if I have a question about museums, I email Rusty. He might know 10 other people in the same boat um, and we can kind of get it done. So yeah, don't, don't hoard your assets and your knowledge because we're all, we're all kind of fighting the same, uh, the same fight. Um, we can yeah. learn from each other. Yeah, and there's, a, there's, there's enough to go around. You know, <laughs> I mean, I haven't, I really haven't bumped into a donor that has said, well, you know, since, since I love that museum 10 miles from you, I'm really not going to give you anything this year. I mean, most of the donors that we deal with they love history and they, if they can, they'll support it, you know, in multiple places. Exactly. Yeah. And it's the same, same with knowledge. Um, it's like, yes, I may have put a lot of research into a program, but if someone else asked me, do you have any suggestions for how to start a colonial garden, which has happened a lot recently, I've yeah. shared my knowledge. I mean, I didn't come up with everything myself. I'm building on other people's building blocks. So I, I, I passed my knowledge on and, I hope others would do the same. Yeah. Oh, one thing I wanted to ask you before we hang up. Have you gotten into the, is it CSA stuff yet? I mean, is there a community garden there or where people have places or, I know that can be tricky. Yeah, no, so we have a large colonial garden. Uh, we haven't kind of done the community owned pots, uh, but we have a large volunteer base that do uh, manage it with us. Yeah. So I have some families that come out on weekdays um, in kind of modern clothes. I have some volunteers like do it on Saturdays in historic clothes. Yeah. Every every Wednesday now we have high school students from the Mercersburg Academy. They come out and do my nature work every Thursday morning. Middle schoolers from James Buchanan come out and do gardening with me. So it's not it's always kind of CI led community work, but definitely yeah. the community are, are doing most of the shoveling. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, this has been really awesome, and I will make sure that we put the Institute's links up, and we'll put it in the description in the YouTube channel, and for folks, um, well, there's, uh, PA Museums has a YouTube channel where these videos are posted, and uh, I can't thank you enough, uh, Matthew, for your time and your consideration today, considering everything that's going on there at the site, and um, I hope to bump into you sometime soon at a conference or somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And for anyone kind of watching, we're very active uh, on social media online, uh, whether that's Facebook or YouTube. Um, and yeah, I just, I just hope everyone else can, is experiencing the same level of kind of optimism uh, mm -hmm. that neither history nor museums are dead. Right. We're just changing the way that we adapt to the community. Yeah. That's a perfect note to end on. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you. Have a great day. Pleasure. Have a good one. Bye.